And we are very privileged. So I really wanna thank um, the state of Georgia and the state of Illinois for uh, coming to this presentation too, to really present what they have done in their states as far as disaster and their, their partnerships and uh, go from there. So next slide, please. Oh, and I guess I should introduce myself, sorry. I'm Sarita Chung. I'm one of the co-leads of the Disaster Domain. Uh, Deanna and Brent are laughing at me. Uh, you met Deanna and Brent yesterday uh, when they did the amazing plenary session, but we're all co-leads for the Disaster Domain. And as I said before, we really just want this session to be um, meaningful or helpful for you. So uh, please, uh, we do have this slide deck and we can go, we'll go through it, uh, but we can also pivot and answer any questions. So really what we thought for this session is really kind of to review disaster response Response, share resources that um, for your awareness for family and healthcare facilities, highlight uh, national pediatric preparedness initiatives, and then really, um, I think the star of our show really is um, Georgia and Illinois. We have Norma Campbell from Georgia, Sue Fuchs, Evelyn Lyons from Illinois to really talk about what they do in their state to promote pediatric disaster uh, planning and response. Next slide. So um, I think we've heard a lot about disasters and I just kind of wanted to, just to set the stage. What does it mean when it's a disaster? And there's official definitions. Um, on your left is the FEMA definition that would um, raise the Stafford Act. So really causing damage of significant, sufficient severity and magnitude to warrant major disaster assistance. And the United Nations says, you know, it's an event which exceeds the ability of the affected society to cope using its own resources. Next slide. And as we know through the years, the frequency of disasters have in, has increased um, nationally and worldwide uh, as far as climate change or uh, disasters due to climate. Um, we just recently had Hurricane Ida. And also as far as active shooter incidences, the numbers have slowly or I guess rapidly increased over the past years. Next slide. And so um, we all know, um, as far as uh, disasters, disasters really help happen locally, but the planning and the money come from the feds. And this is just a graphic of the national response framework, where if a disaster occurs, the local re uh, first responders come and they look, um, they tell their authorities that there is a disaster, it goes up to the governor, governor, the governor asks aid from the federal government, and then then they start coordinating resources to come down. And that's why in a lot of disasters, there is a pre initiation or pre-disaster declaration to make sure that all the responses are in place when that disaster hits, if we, we know that the disaster is coming, such as a hurricane um, or other um, events. So this is kind of our, I would say a little bit of our Bible is like the 2010 National Commission of Children Disasters really was a bipartisan group to look at all the gaps in the US as like, what can we do to improve pediatric disaster preparedness and response? I reported it to the president and to Congress. And really the bottom line is, um, if you wanna click Meredith, is really they said that too long there's been a pattern of benign neglect towards children and disaster planning, preparedness, response and recovery. And so I think we've actually really moved the needle since 2010, but we're nowhere near as similar as pediatric readiness or nowhere near where we want to be. Next slide. And I, th I think we can't ignore that um, we are in this silly pandemic, right? That we're in this pandemic. You've now seen various preparedness plans and their outcomes and continue to participate. Thank you. Um, you know, thank you for all your work and a pandemic response. And collectively, while you may not think that you're a disaster expert, you actually are a disaster expert. You all, we all now have disaster expertise. Next slide. And what, uh, Build what is the foundation for pediatric disaster readiness is really um, ED readiness. And so um, similarly as many talks in this conference is really how do you make sure that the emergency departments in your region are ready for kids? Because if we know that they're ready for kids, then the pediatric disaster response will go so much more smoothly. Next slide. And so now I wanna turn it over to Norma, just really to talk about um, the initiatives that they have done in their state. Hi. 
thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to showcase Georgia because I'm very proud of all of the stakeholders that really come together on a routine basis to move the that whole preparedness needle forward. So um, one thing is I've been in this position about five years now. When I first got in, having to look around and just see how is the state positioned? Where are the strengths and weaknesses? Who can I align with? And it took me a while to get to know people and network. There was not a really uh, strong presence of EMSC prior to this. We did have a grant, but it was kind of um, not quite aggressive, I guess, in, in networking. That was probably a shortfall. So um, the first thing I saw was that we did have a very strong networking in um, preparedness. Emergency preparedness in Georgia is truly um, a lot of eager people that have come together and have gotten a lot of plans that have moved forward. I feel really uh, comfortable being a part of that team because I know that we have routine trainings that involves everyone and and I feel confident in the team and that's a good it's a good feeling. Um, first of all, we have a quarterly meeting, which is a mutual aid task force meeting. Some states do have this. I don't know if how many, but um, that gives us a platform where we can meet other people in healthcare, fire departments, police departments, just really a large gamut of different people that would come together in a disaster. We can exchange ideas, disaster plans. We can look at um, maybe some suggestions that someone may have from that group, or we can even offer those suggestions. So that relationship is extremely important. And I found that going to those quarterly meetings is, is one of the highlights of what I do because I learn so much. Um, and it, it, there is a lot of support for children once you really start to network with the people that are there with that group. Um, in doing that, I've been able to pinpoint some very key stakeholder people uh, that have helped us with our strategic plan in Georgia EMSC. So certainly um, bringing that closer network in to now a more personal basis, I've also invited several people into the advisory council for EMSC in Georgia. So now you're even meeting at different times, not just for that mutual uh, task force team every quarter, but also another meeting that's gonna bring you together for the uh, advisory council for EMSC. And then we even have monthly meetings, which is um, what we call PHEC. And then some states have that. I know Florida does. It's the Pediatric Healthcare Improvement Coalition. And that's mostly made up of our pediatric hospitals. Um, there's other groups that do have um, a member part of that. Um, Natalie Lane, Dr. Lane is the chair of that. She's also the chair of our EMSC Advisory Council. She's the medical director at Augusta University's um, Children's Hospital, we call Children's Hospital of Georgia. She's been very instrumental in promoting EMSC and the preparedness together. And having that kind of um, stakeholder involvement, especially as someone who has a, a very affluent position in the state, does truly help to bring things um, much more uh, rapidly into any kind of change. We have an annual EMSC um, conference that's held on EMSC day. And Dr. Lane is the one who organizes that. I'm very, very spoiled <laughs> that I'm fortunate that I have Dr. Lane here in the state. Um, and with that, I know in the past several years, we've been promoting a pediatric emergency care coordinator for everyone of our disaster coalition areas. So if we can have someone from all of our 14 areas around the state that is there for their emergency management responsibilities, but have someone in that group that's looking out for kids, and that's what we've been promoting, that's really going to um, be the boots on the ground to move the individual communities closer to that pediatric readiness. So when we have our EMSC, it, conferences once a year, we also have a breakout room for them. We invite them. Uh, it's hard to keep up with who our emergency care coordinators are for pediatrics because it's in many other ways in this job, there's a, a lot of um, 
turnover. So that's a communication. You have to continually stay on top of it with the emails. And I think it does help to have newsletters and, and ways to, to network with each other through not just meetings, but also emails and, you know, any opportunity that you can have. So having that conference has helped. Having the quarterly um, mutual aid task force has helped. And um, of course, we were also having to promote that pediatric emergency care coordinator position. And um, we do that in every opportunity that we can, where we believe that we'll have the preparedness emergency managers or those that are having that interest in preparedness there. So um, that brings us to many other conferences throughout the state. So you could be talking of, of police conferences and fire conferences, of course, EMS, and um, just promoting that we need a person who's looking out for children in that particular sector. So those are the highlights. I'm um, certainly more than happy to talk about what we do and share any of what we've developed with any of the states if they'd like. Thank you. Norma, we do have a question in the chat from Erica Kane on how often you reach out to your pecs with emails. She does it quarterly, but well, wonder if she'd do more regularly. That, honestly, I, I probably, I have different categories of pecs, right? So I have those that through the emergency management groups and disaster preparedness, I go through our Georgia Hospital Association, Adrienne Feinberg. She's in charge of really organize a lot of that preparedness group. And she will send it out to all of the PECs, all of the regions, everything. So that's probably monthly. The um, PECs that are for EMS, our EMS PECs need a more routinely um, more frequent email exchange, I'd say that's gonna be, if I can once a week, that would be great. I try to do once a week, it's at least twice a month if I can't do one, because sometimes we do get kind of um, busy backlogged. And then our hospital pecs, um, there's different resources. Sometimes I have to send to each one of these groups. Sometimes I can send them all the same, like a newsletter. But uh, so our hospital pecs, uh, again, like our EMS, probably about twice a month, hopefully every week, but it, I just don't always get that way. So, but I have other people that are on our advisory council that also share with the same groups. And I also have EMS see chairs that are um, throughout the state. We have 10 of them. They're chairs over a, a subcommittee in their region. And they can send out things to their each one of their regions, hospital and emergency management packs, as well as the EMS packs. So that's helpful. So they're not just hearing from me with that role. They're hearing from different stakeholders. Great, thank you, Norma. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to Brent. Hey guys, so we just wanted to take a moment to share with you some resources that we think are pretty high yield. <clears throat> These are resources that are available both via the American Academy of Pediatrics, Children and Disasters webpage, and through the EIIC, EMSC Innovations and Improvement Center. This, this one in particular is our family readiness kit put together by the AAP and, and I think all of, many of the speakers from the EIC, were, if not all were involved in the creation of this, it was revamped recently. Um, I highlight this kit in a number of talks that I give even to healthcare workers and, and providers, because I think it does a great job of really easily walking through the steps to develop a robust uh, preparedness plan. And it does a nice job of, of kind of organizing things geographically to assess what your true risks and hazards might be for your area. So this is a great resource to not just use for yourselves, but also to potentially promote. Um, you know, I think from a state partnership grantee position, this could be a great thing to tweet out or put on your social media during preparedness month to raise awareness for families with, their, with regards to the need to develop a preparedness plan. Next slide. This is the uh, EIC's created, or the EIC is currently in the process of revamping this, but this is an older version of the essential pediatric domains and considerations 
every hospital's disaster preparedness policies. So this is a checklist that goes through <clears throat> looking at all of the things that hospitals should be taking into consideration when trying to you know, develop a pediatric or a disaster plan that really incorporates and includes children in that plan. And I, I will tell you that we are currently in the process of revamping this and I'm excited that soon we will likely have a new version of this checklist. Uh, some of the key things that I think will be kind of some add to the older version will be, we will really be targeting different types of hospitals. So a little bit of kind of different checklist kind of action items for, you know, kind of critical access hospitals versus pediatric centers, et cetera. So really, regardless of where you kind of fall at baseline, should have hopefully have some uh, items that you can check off and improve your degree of preparedness. Uh, next slide. In addition to the checklist, the EIC has worked on creating some um, quality improvement projects. Uh, this is a kind of quick look at one of those, which is a quality improvement project specific for um, outpatient-based pediatricians. And this project actually provides maintenance of certification part four credit for pediatricians. Uh, we have two versions of this. One is uh, hospital-based and one is a kind of clinic-based, uh, but really trying to get to the nuts and bolts of quality improvement. Uh, as you can see, this one has, as does the hospital one, but they're a little bit different, seven domains that we target. And over the course of a six-month cohort, you work through the development of an emergency kit, looking at alternative power sources for your clinic, specifically highlighting issues like vaccine storage and record backup of records, uh, ways to communicate with your staff and, 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 and families and patients, um, in particular, also a separate section related to children with special health care needs, and in general, kind of some, some low-hanging fruit of improving staff awareness and preparedness using some of the tools that we already mentioned. So this, through working through this cohort, we provide what we think are some of the best resources available, and you get kind of a beginning score, and over the course of the six months, we see how things improve in, in this setting, and so this is Again, I think a really good resource for in particular pediatricians as they can get that maintenance of certification part four credit, which many of us are eager to try to check off when we're looking at our recertification, but also does a great job of walking through folks as to how to get better prepared for disasters. And next slide, the last uh, couple of things I really wanted to highlight, and I already mentioned the American Academy of Pediatrics Children and Disasters website. It's got a plethora of resources, including the topical collections, which has uh, some highlighted topics and uh, chapters on various disaster related um, issues, but then I also wanted to highlight the family reunification following disasters toolkit. Uh, this was really the uh, brainchild of Sarita Chung and many others assisted her with in the creation of this, but it's a terrific planning tool for facilities to work through what a family reunification plan would look like for their institution. And I think really the main reason we want to bring some of these resources up is these are resources that many folks in your state may not know are aware. And as you know, the state partnership grantees or others in the community, you know, you're kind of the voice of children oftentimes at the table and being able to share some of these great resources will kind of hopefully take some of the burden off of those centers to come up with these things from scratch. So hopefully um, these are some great resources that you'll seek out after this talk and use uh, in the future. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Sarita to introduce our next speaker. Great, thank you. So, um, as I said, this is a, one of our other highlights is the state of Illinois. And so I'm going to turn it over to Evelyn and Sue to really talk about what they've done and how they've done it. Um, I think what's important is like not only hearing um, that this can be done, but how did you get there? So, Evelyn and Sue, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarita. So I'll begin and then I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Sue Fuchs. Um, next slide. So our EMSC program has been really fortunate to receive hospital preparedness program funding. And I have to say that um, some of that is due in part that 
to the fact that we actually, our program actually sits within the same office as our HPP program. So that proximity really has um, helped us get their ear and also their support for um, us being able to access funding and be able to support a number of the initiatives that you're gonna hear about in the next few minutes. So every year a set of deliverables is defined for EMSC in our state and HPP is allocated um, with the amount varying over the years. ASPR, which is the federal office within which the HPP program resides, they actually want to see an established relationship between state HPP and EMSC programs. So if your state EMSC program does not currently have a relationship with your state HPP program or receive any funding from them, it would be really advantageous for you to explore that further, see if you can get your foot in the door, have a seat at their table and begin to look at um, approaching them to secure some funding. Every year as state HPP programs submit their grant applications, they actually ask for a letter of support from the state EMSC program. So I'm sure the majority of you have developed a letter and sent that in to them to include with their grant application. Actually in Illinois, um, I'm asked to do two letters, one for our state recipient, and then the city of Chicago is one of the cities that the federal uh, program also funds. So we have two letters that go out to both of those entities and we put in that letter that we do get funding, how we work with them closely and some of the activities that have been conducted over the previous year. So kind of use that as an opportunity to leverage um, requesting some funding at all. In addition, in the current federal ASPR cooperative agreement uh, with states and key cities, ASPR actually requires um, that there are healthcare coalition annexes that are being developed to their mass casualty response plans. And one of those required annexes is a pediatric specific annex. So what we did through our EMSC program is we provided res resources to each of the 11 healthcare coalitions within our state to assist them with that endeavor. We also reviewed each of their finalized um, pediatric coalition annexes, and then we provided each of the 11 coalitions with a report in which we identified the strengths within their individual pediatric annex, as well as outlined some opportunities for improvement. And we used the checklist from the Esper Tracy site. We also used some other resources so that we were using very objective criteria as we reviewed um, these annex, annexes. And the state HPP coordinator was really, um, she, that was really well received by her. It gave her a good handle on where each of the coalitions was in terms of their pediatric annex. And she appreciated the feedback and we'll use that moving forward to assure that each of those coalitions look at those opportunities for improvement and look at ways that they can improve their, um, their annex even further. HPP funding has also supported the hiring of a full-time pediatric disaster preparedness coordinator in our state. And that role has been filled by multiple individuals over the years and has been instrumental in facilitating a standing state pediatric preparedness work group, which was established actually back in 2002, shortly after 9-11. And this work group has been responsible for identifying pediatric needs and developing and revising a number of pediatric preparedness resources over the years, which Dr. Fuchs will go into a little bit more detail regarding. Um, but just to talk a little bit more about the work group, um, they serve to enhance our statewide pediatric disaster preparedness infrastructure. So a few years ago, each state um, um, American Academy of Pediatrics chapter was asked to identify a physician contact for disaster preparedness. And in each state, this person then acts as a liaison to AAP regarding disaster efforts within their respective state. And so the disaster contact for the Illinois chapter of AAP actually serves as the chairperson for our state pediatric preparedness work group. And this just helps us solidify further the relationship with our AAP chapter 
with respect to disaster preparedness. In addition, as I've mentioned, our state is divided into 11 healthcare coalition, um, regional coalitions, and each coalition is responsible for disaster planning and response within their geographic region. So we wanted to have a direct connection with those 11 coalitions so that they would be always aware of what the work group was involved, involved in and also have some input as to the activities. Um, and, and also the ability for them to provide, for there to be just a back and forth um, feedback loop from them and from us to them. And so we asked each coalition to identify a pediatric representative from their coalition who would serve on our work group. And so each of those coalition representatives, they act as a liaison between the state work group and their regional coalition. And they provide a report at our meeting so that they give us an update on what kind of pediatric activities are taking place within their region. Lately, they've been letting us know um, COVID and RSV surge impact within their, within their community. Um, but other times they'll talk about other activities that they're working on that have a pediatric bent to it. So this has been an avenue for integrating the resources and recommendations from the Pediatric Preparedness Work Group into the planning coalition um, activities. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Fuchs who'll talk a little bit more. Thank you. Um, in terms of what Evelyn mentioned is the uh, HPP wanted us to, they have the state ESF-8 plan and they wanted a pediatric neonatal and, uh, and neonatal surgenix. So the group did that and did such a nice job that they then turned around and said, how about if you do the burn surgenix and then the functional and access needs or fan or at risk populations annex. So like I said, if you do a good job, um, the good news is they usually keep sending you money. Obviously we do have to do deliverables, but it, it helps when they recognize what we're doing and that it's very uh, worthwhile. Other things we've developed, um, we have addressing the needs of children and disaster preparedness exercises. Um, we also have Illinois Jumpstart Mass Casualty Triage Training. And I did see in the, uh, pre-hospital pediatric toolkit that our pediatric disaster triage utilizing jumpstart method. Um, we have an online educational module and that is actually in that uh, set. Um, I think Evelyn's gonna put down how we, if you wanna do this, these are also CME courses or CEU courses that you can get credit. Um, so that, that way you can uh, access them online um, and then get that. We've also done a lot of kind of evacuation drills. Probably the scariest is like the NICU in the nursery, I'm thinking about you know how many infants are on ventilators or how many uh, infants are attached to several lines and how do you even try to evacuate that? I think they were mentioning, uh, I saw on the news you know in Louisiana that they kept the, those kids there until they figured out where they can send them. Um, but basically, it uses what we developed for the NICU evacuation guidelines, and then we actually have had several tabletop drills. So things that we learn from those drills um, and then that the toolkit provides hospitals with guidance on planning, conducting and evaluating tabletop exercises. We've also done, as, as uh, Evelyn mentioned, we have our hospital preparedness resources. As part of facility recognition requirements, our pediatric uh, disaster coordinator goes out on these site visits. So it's actually our, our kind of page ready uh, program. And she actually separately goes through the disaster plans as well as any uh, discussions with the safety officer, EMS uh, disaster person that is at the hospital. When we send them the application, there's a separate disaster plan review and actually a checklist. And that this provides the hospitals a way to identify what their current level of preparedness is, as well as to give them an idea about where should they go in the future. Now, obviously, they don't have to have it complete. That's the idea is that if you are missing something, to have a plan of action. And I think, you know, we've tried to provide a lot of resources to the hospitals that give them that information. Um, we also have a pediatric medical specialist team. This is actually a group of 15 MDs and APNs who can provide telephone or telehealth uh, information and guidance to facilities during a disaster. Um, what can happen is we initially, this is part of the state medical disaster team, which we call IMERT, but we are not boots on the ground. 
we realize that there's not enough of us across the state and oftentimes our availability is limited for we can't go for two weeks so we decided the phone triage uh, or telehealth would be the best way to do that and what they can do is when a disaster is declared we would man a phone line 24 7 and if a hospital has questions about where can they send a child because of a surge we would help work with them to to distribute children as well as help provide some medical care over the phone for them other things we've developed is a disaster mental health response for children, which is another online educational module, uh, which helps identify needs of pediatric survivors. Um, we also have hospital evacuation guidelines. I mentioned the NICU ones, but we actually expanded this now to assist hospitals with addressing the needs for hospitalized newborns, infants, children, adolescents, and even laboring mothers uh, during evacuation. So the use of this guide is really for planning activities to identify concepts, tools and resources, as well as equipment and supplies that you would need during this. Um, they're not all inclusive, but we do have them available. The other thing is we developed an emergency preparedness planning guide for child care centers and child care homes. Um, and it is really is just to help them develop their process. We are revising a couple other resources. Um, we have a pediatric and neonatal disaster surge guide. This is actually based off of the LA County, they called it a pocket guide, at about 120 pages, it's hardly a pocket guide anymore, um, but we are revising that. We also have P pediatric and neonatal care guidelines. This is also something that could be used in a disaster. It will assist the pediatric medical specialist team with you know, providing information, but also, especially for a uh, disaster, if you have a critical access hospital that doesn't even have pediatric patients anymore, all of a sudden they're forced to keep, to care for either you know, some newborns or a pediatric patient, at least some guidelines that they can use, as well as what equipment they would need to have um, for this particular you know, disaster until they could indeed transfer somebody out. Another thing that we found very useful is we developed with respiratory therapy, um, the use of the SNS ventilators in the pediatric patient and instructional guidelines. We realized that you know, even when you're in the ED, uh, we don't know all these ventilators. So having sort of a quick uh, cheat sheet about how to set them up would be very helpful. We're revising this, especially because now the SNS stockpile ventilators have changed. So we're sort of working with that um, and our respiratory therapists on new guidelines. Um, we're gonna, um, after I'm done, I'll put in the website, kind of we have a pediatric preparedness resource catalog and I will, um, you can go to our website and I'll put that in just for all the disaster material as well as a specific disaster related uh, activities catalog and I'll, I'll put that information in the webs in the chat room as well. Thank you, Evelyn. So that's like amazing. I mean, I think as uh, Deanna said, this is like something we should all strive for. I, I want to just say like, I think I would point out that you've been working on this since 2002. So it's not, I would say for those who are starting that we wouldn't expect that you would expect um, be able to do so much within the first year, but this is um, this is almost a, you've developed some lifelong partnerships and have developed um, really being able to work together to um, really produce some nice products. I'm gonna turn this over to Deanna, um, really also just to talk about um, her work and uh, some resources from the Eagle, um, the regional uh, disaster networks. Well, hello everyone. Um, so I'm very excited to be able to sort of um, chat with you about some of the things that um, we've created out of the Pediatric Centers of Excellence and some of our next exciting adventures that we have. So I think all of you recognize this, um, these photos and have probably seen this before that, you know, children are not little adults and what makes them more vulnerable um, <clears throat> in disasters, especially in, in different kinds of situations. And I think um, you know, the thing that's not probably mentioned on here is that, um, uh, you know, COVID and the pandemic has identified vulnerabilities that we probably didn't even predict um, when we thought about, you know, having to, um, you know, socially distance, not go to school, uh, be virtual. Um, just saw the headline today about the increase in obesity among kids um, and so on. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that have happened in this um, uh, pandemic. And I think, you know, we will continue to learn um, as we go and be nimble enough to hopefully be able to get tools out to you and help you figure out how to answer some of these questions. So next slide. 
So um, when we start to think about national pediatric preparedness initiatives and how these have all sort of been put together, um, this was a slide that was put up by Dr. Cadillac uh, multiple years ago at a coalition conference when he talked about, you know, what his vision was for, you know, how we want to see this all happen. So, you know, he sort of talked about the, the, you know, tier one is the state local territory stuff. Tier two is more of a regional response where you work together probably with multiple states and things like that. And then the tier three is the federal response. And this is Department of Defense, um, NDMS, things like that. So, um, back in 2018, they created um, the first two regional centers. They did um, uh, they did the um, Nebraska Regional Disaster um, Health Response, and Massachusetts is not on here, but uh, oh, there it is, uh, the Regional Disaster Health Response for Massachusetts um, area. So, and both of those were funded in 2018, and then received um, more funding in 2019 to actually expand their scope a little bit. So that was very exciting. But also in 2019, um, the ASPR decided to fund two centers of pediatric excellence and. Um, one is the Eastern Great Lakes, which is um, uh, Michigan and Ohio, and the other is the Rapham Group, which involves um, upwards of now of like five states, but I think they're up to six because they've included Utah, so they've done a little bit of expansion. So, of course, right during the middle of our one-year uh, regionalization of pediatric initiatives, uh, we had COVID. So um, we we pivoted. We learned how to create um, tools and uh, things that could be used um, immediately for um, people that, you know, were worried about children with COVID and what was happening and address um, issues and during that time. So it was really quite exciting. And now we're um, back on 2020 and, or 2021 now, sort of um, getting ready to wrap up what we consider our um, second year um, in for both of the groups. And we are anticipating going into a third year um, and if not a fourth year um, for continued work with um, uh, our partners. Um, and hopefully we'll be expanding out to what in the Eastern Great Lakes region will be called FEMA 5 for Kids, which will be the FEMA Region 5 region. So we're very excited about that, but we all fit into this tier two regional health disaster response. So really coordinating on a regional level, um, working with children's hospitals, working with um, what we call non-children's hospitals, looking at capacity, capability, education, uh, tools, um, really just sort of um, pre-hospital, hospital, emergency departments, and everything up and down. So it's kind of a, it's been really a great chance to work with a lot of partners, really have better relationships with the state. And I think that um, both, um, it sounds like Georgia and um, Illinois have really showed great examples of how to work with, you know, AAP, EMSC, how to work with your state partners and things like that. Um, Michigan, Ohio have been a very um, interesting group to work with because we have um, differences in how states are governed and that um, creates its own challenges. Um, and so we um, have to work through some of those at the state level with state uh, rule law and things like that. So next slide. Wanted to just sort of highlight some of the work from the Eastern Great Lakes um, that has come out. So these are these are um, items that we've put together. We've put, um, done a deep dive into supply chain on the pediatric um, supply chain uh, thing um, items. Uh, we've come up with a critical supplies list um, that are for pediatrics um, that we've both shared with the ASPR um, that hopefully will get shared with the um, SNS. Um, in addition to the RAPM group, in addition to some of our regional coalitions, um, and just looking at that, especially with the onset of the pediatric surge that people are worried about with this COVID and RSV um, uh, kind of connection. Um, we've done multiple exercises, um, uh, mostly on virtual platforms for the past um, two years. We've done both, uh, we did a surge exercise that um, evolved around COVID. Um, about a year ago to now to this day um, that really sort of looked at how would you um, expand cap capacity and capability. We um, looked at a reunification drill in, in cooperation with the EIIC and the um, uh, quality disaster domain that we created for 31 hospitals. It was really a great um, chance for people to sort of explore what their reunification 
um, strategies would be and sort of share what they sort of best practices that they sort of discovered when they were talking with each other. Um, we did a deep dive into behavioral health. The behavioral health stuff has been really been fascinating. We've looked at um, not only during COVID, providing resources out to families, as well as community hospitals, um, discharge, things like that, as you're sort of dealing with the um, COVID um, crisis. And I think, again, some of that those resources are coming to bear again. They're all on the EIC website. Um, and uh, we've got infographics out. We've got more materials coming out. We've created a pediatric center at HVA for hospitals to take a look at that they can go ahead and sort of, you know, figure out what the capacity is. We've come up with a regional metric scorecard that looks at situational awareness for things that are related to both um, physical and um, our social and um, uh, social determinants of health um, for children so that we can really um, try and sort of emphasize those kinds of things. Um, and um, we've also got some great tools coming out, hopefully this month, um, in honor of preparedness month uh, for children um, and youth with special health care needs. Um, they're um, disaster infographics that are in multiple languages, in addition to some short videos that are also translated into multiple languages. So they're very accessible to um, uh, vulnerable populations all over the um, United States and even internationally. So we're excited to be able to share some of those tools um, as they become available. Um, our stuff is all available on the EIIC website because we wanted to make sure that we um, had one landing page um, for things that are disaster related. And I think it's really important not to have you know, 50 landing pages all over. That's why it's really great when like people like Illinois and Georgia, when you develop tools that you actually share them with the EIIC so that they can actually go into um, the website so that, you know, if people just happen to be searching one website, they won't miss something that is so critical and so useful. So these are just some of the products that we've had and I'm happy to announce um, it's official today, um, but um, we, um, we at Rainbow, are the recipients of um, one of, of the um, pediatric pandemic grant from HRSA, um, RPPN, um, and our um, collaborating sites. Rainbow is the lead along with um, University of San Francisco Benioff Children's Hospital, um, Primary Children's in Utah, Cardinal Glennon in St. Louis, and um, Norton Children's in Louisville. So we're very excited to start that work on pediatric pandemic work. And many of you um, will hopefully be able to see some of that come out in the next um, few years as we work in partnership, both with the two centers of excellence, as well as the EIIC, the AAP, CDC, and other important partners um, as we build this network of networks for children in the pandemic. Thank you, Deanna. I think given that we have only four minutes left, we were going to talk a little bit about the pediatric surge annex, but I think you've heard um, a little bit about it in our, our talks. And just so you're aware, um, if you have not already been pulled into helping with the pediatric surge annex, I just strongly encourage you to um, participate in that conversation just to make sure that the healthcare coalition is really also including the needs of children. So, um, uh, next slide. So we can skip through all these slides. Um, just wanted to show a picture of my children. Oh, actually, we can stop here. This is um, the pediatric dashboard. I would just, if you go back one, Meredith, it's just, um, I think this is an example of uh, uh, what the Mountain States Pediatric Disaster Coalition did, but really, uh, I know it's um, can't see as well, but they have really been able to pull all their hospitals together to get real time data. And so on the left are the hospitals in each of the states and what their availability is of certain um, capabilities. And so uh, they have built this dashboard and this dashboard continues to exist. So I think this is something um, I'm eager to see in um, different regions or even brought up to the federal level if this is something that we can um, do. So this is an example of um, something that's already um, being used. Next slide. And so in summary, I think uh, pediatric disaster build, uh, readiness it builds on pediatric readiness. And so we really did wanna highlight the examples of EMSC state partnership disaster preparedness initiatives. Really thank you again for being here, but also your role in your state for 
promoting pediatric readiness. And uh, now we hope to show you how you can promote pediatric disaster readiness. And the EMSC EIC disaster domain is here to help. So if you have any questions or any comments, Meredith, I don't know if there's anything in the chat that you wanted to bring up. I don't see anything specific. Lots of great links and resources, and um, we'll hopefully try to save this chat and make them available for y'all to access later. But um, you can reach out to the group, see if there's any questions. We have about a minute left. And please feel free to reach out to Deanna, Brent, or I, and we're happy to answer also any questions or share our um, stories of success and challenges as we uh, evolve in disaster work. Thank you. Mm -hmm.